Welcome everyone to another of our LaunchX alumni interview series. This week we have Jacob Johnston on the line and he'll be sharing a little bit about his entrepreneurial journey, uh, his time at LaunchX and since, uh, as well as his most recent company, Foundation Devices. Uh, so Jacob, let's have you take it away. So I guess I'll just start by uh you know, explaining, uh, like Lori said, about how I got into entrepreneurship. And then I'll talk a little bit about launch. And uh, then I can, you know, tell you guys about Foundation, which is uh, my current startup. So, um, yeah, as Lori said, I went to launch in 2014, um, part of the second year. I think it was the second session. Um, and, yeah, it was amazing. It provided me with uh, a lot of different resources, mentors, teachers, um, you know, a big network of speakers and students to kind of just play off of and um, learn from and, and, you know, garner ideas from. And uh, I'm actually still friends with a lot of those people, you know, today. So I have mentors from the program and everything like that. So I even loved it so much. I went back and I was an intern, I think in 2016. And then um, I was actually also a residential counselor in 2017. So um, really like launch. Um, hope that I can even maybe go back someday and be a, another counselor or something like that. Um, but yeah, after, after launch, I kind of got catapulted into a ton of different entrepreneurial programs, uh, hackathons. Uh, at the time, I was going to boarding school, actually, in Arkansas. And uh, I was in my second year when I had gotten back from launch, kind of thinking about you know, what can I do to, you know, further the company that we started, which was called Land Me. Um, and so I kind of worked on that for a little bit. Um, it was a little difficult, though, because uh, our whole team was spread out. We had, you know, four kind of separate lives going on. Um, a couple of my co-founders actually ended up going to Ivy League schools. So they, you know, had a lot of uh, responsibility there in terms of their education and, and you know, family responsibilities and stuff like that. So, um, we, did, we actually decided that about a year and a half, I think, or two years after the program that uh, we didn't, we weren't going to continue it, but that we would still, you know, keep it on the back burner as, as a potential opportunity to come back to. Um, and actually, since then, I've, I've had some people message me about Land Me and, and actually try and help out with it, you know, bring it back to life and stuff like that. So that, that's actually something I've been looking into and, and trying to see, you know, if I have the bandwidth to maybe just take it online and keep it there for, you know, people that are interested. But um, but yeah, so after, after Land Me, I um, actually ended up going to college. Um, initially, I'd committed to Babson, which is also in Massachusetts, uh, near MIT and Harvard and all those other great schools, but um, had some family things myself and ended up having to come back to Arkansas, which is actually where I'm currently at now. Um, and yeah, I went to college here for a little bit and didn't really end up liking the, uh, the traditional education path, the post-secondary education path. So um, I was searching around for different things to do and got an internship um, at a local company in Arkansas called the Arkansas Regional Innovation Hub. And it's kind of just like a co-working space, maker space set up. Um, they run entrepreneurial programming and, and do all that kind of thing. Um, so I did that for about a year. And then I transitioned while I was still in college. I, I actually, with the help of uh, a connection of Lori's, um, got a job at a company in Boston called Formlabs. So I, I was there for two years almost, uh, had a really amazing time. And, and I think that something that's important to know um, about my entrepreneurial journey in specific is that I didn't necessarily um, like shove my own idea like down my throat or like make sure that I had to pursue one certain thing. Um, going to Formlabs was kind of like a outlier, I guess you would say. Um, instead of me, you know, doing my own business, I kind of had to take a step back and, you know, join a company that was already, you know, properly seated and had a uh, good market share and, you know, had tons of employees so that I could actually, you know, learn a lot of the different things about company structure and operations and stuff that I maybe wasn't necessarily exposed to um, at a smaller startup. So I think that that really helped me a lot um, to gain, you know, perspective and, and to, to learn a lot more about the internal workings of sales and operations and all that good stuff. Um, so th that was a really awesome experience. So you call Form Labs a bigger company, but I know I think of it as a startup. And uh, so for people on the call that may not know what Form Labs is, can you, can you share a little bit about it? So um, Form Labs is a desktop stereolithography company. So they're a 3D printing company that, that makes uh, 
3D printers, and uh, they're, they're actually more recently expanding into other types of 3D printing other than SLA. Now they make um, SLS printers, which is uh, selective laser centering, which is nylon. Um, so that's pretty sweet. Um, but their whole um, mission, I, I guess, is to basically make it to where you can take these really amazing technologies like SLA and SLS that are traditionally hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, you know, for a makerspace or a lab to acquire, and you can shrink that down into a desktop version that you can put, you know, in your house or in your office or something like that. Um, but yeah, they're doing really well. I think when I joined, they were, I was employee 203, and I think they have a thousand in Somerville alone now. So they're doing really well. But, um, but yeah, like I, I think that Form Labs really gave me, uh, like I said, a lot of those skills that I, I wouldn't otherwise, you know, it was just a much more structured thing, I would say. And it also exposed me to things like equity and shares and exercising options and different stuff that you wouldn't necessarily get into with your own company unless you reached a point of like raising money or selling part of your company or something like that. It's a cool perspective. I know a lot of launchies tend to go to bigger companies for experience, you know, the like Google's or, or Microsoft or um, Facebook. Um, but those companies tend to have like specific guidelines, roles, uh, expectations. And if you go to these smaller companies, then, you know, there's a lot more opportunity for growth and to develop your own um, roles and everything within the company. So a lot of differences of what to think about and of what you're looking for at that stage of your career. Definitely. And I think that's what I was really looking for. I mean, I was applying to those places, right? Um, and, and that's something that maybe I can speak to a little bit too, is, is actually rejection. Because me not having a, um, a post-secondary degree actually makes it very difficult um, to navigate those sorts of companies. Um, I'll give you an example. Actually, more recently, even after I left Form Labs, I already had, uh, I think it was three years of professional work experience at that point, or two and a half, because of the Innovation Hub and then because of Form Labs. And uh, I had a warm referral, like someone who worked at the office that I was trying to get into at Google, um, and I didn't even get an interview. So, I mean, it's it's pretty crazy um, and competitive uh, these days in, in that regard because, you know, there's algorithms that screen your resume and, and there's certain things that those bigger companies do that um, kind of, you know, just push you out if you don't have, you know, certain prerequisites. But that's, you know, that's not to say that, um, you know, eventually in the future I couldn't get a job at Google or that I don't want to, but um, it, it's just, uh, it's definitely something to consider, like when, when you're going through your career path and stuff like that, whether or not a degree is, is required or not. I would say more recently now these days, it's, it's not so much uh, a big issue, but it still does definitely play a factor, you know, versus experience and stuff like that. Instead of going the corporate route, you know, what, what can I create that is really like new and different instead of something that's, you know, structured as a company like that, that would turn out to be, you know, massive and, and very centralized and, and having like those levels of, uh, of like how being able to promote and get moved up and stuff like that. And having those very niche job descriptions, like at Form Labs, like you said, it gave me a lot more mobility to, to, you know, move, I moved actually from sales to sales operations and just that one singular move at a company like Google, like probably wouldn't have been possible because they're completely separate departments. They're completely separate management structures and uh, skill sets that are required and things like that. But I was kind of learning live on the job at Form Labs, getting to experience, you know, all of that kind of lean methodology, like scrappiness um, and, and learning all of those things like on the fly, uh, which kind of puts some pressure on you. It kind of forces you to learn some stuff because you know, if you, if you end up not learning it, then you might, you know, be without a job pretty soon. So it's, uh, it was, it put me in a, in a place where I really did have to learn a lot of, of stuff that I wouldn't have otherwise looked into. Um, and, and that's what, uh, I guess the next section of the professional career or entrepreneurial career would be after Form Labs, I actually ended up, um, joining another startup that was even more closely related um, to my, my interests and, and what I really wanted to accomplish, but yet it, it wasn't, it wasn't mine still at that point. Um, it wasn't like my company that I helped create. I was just still an employee at, at that point. So, um, but that's Obelisk and that's a, a cryptocurrency mining company, um, that I actually joined in, in 2018 after I left Form Labs. 
Um, and I worked there and shipped uh, 12,000 hardware devices all over the world, which was a crazy experience. Um, tons of, uh, of learnings and uh, mistakes and problems, <laughs> and uh, as there is with all hardware. So that really taught me oh, a lot of awesome. scrappiness. If, if I remember, you'd done Bitcoin mining before. That's at the, if we really want to get into the root root of the entrepreneurship stuff, um, I, when I was like 11 or 12, I was reading tech like news websites, like, you know, people who review like the newest headphones or the newest laptops or things like that. And I thought that was the coolest thing. Like at the time that was kind of like post.com bubble when everyone was making blogs and tech review sites like that. So I kind of wanted to do that. And um, that's that's kind of where I started. I, I wanted to start a website where I reviewed new products and made ads and got ad revenue and stuff like that. And that flopped horribly. Um, but after that, I, I started getting into Minecraft because one of my favorite uh, tech review sites had a Minecraft server. Like the, these, I think it was called Techno Buffalo was the name of the of the of the blog. And um, they had a, a server where you could go play Minecraft. So I thought that was the coolest thing. Um, actually ended up meeting some some people who were my age at the time, 13, 14 years old on this Minecraft server. Um, and years or months, actually just months later, six, seven months later, we ended up starting our own Minecraft server. And that kind of expanded and blew up into us selling Minecraft servers. And that's what got me started in the business of selling servers and, and like VP S's, virtual private servers and web hosting and stuff like that. Um, and, and then that propelled into, after the server hosting thing, me looking into doing Bitcoin mining servers because they were, it was a similar kind of physical structure. Like if you host a server in a data center, um, they, they measure it based on how much space it takes. So it's like one U or two U or four U or whatever. And the servers that we were using for game server hosting, we could theoretically we thought we could fit a bitcoin miner in that space um and then you know just have people buy that and put it in data centers and, and host them just like we were hosting minecraft servers um and so that's that was what i really wanted to do at the time but if, if you can imagine i mean i think i was 15 or 16 years old trying to do that uh with one other 15 year old kid with no funding and um it, it was just a crazy scenario that, that it did, and it didn't end up working out. At Obelisk, it was kind of fulfilling that that dream of when I was when I was a teenager of wanting to build Bitcoin miners, even though they weren't Bitcoin miners, they were other cryptocurrency miners for Saya uh, and another currency called Decred. But you know, still the same principle of technology, and we were designing and building ASICs and stuff like that. So it it was really amazing to see that come to fruition. So. After after Obelisk, though, um, you know, we were having a little bit of discrepancy and decision making between us and the parent company, and we wanted to do some other products after we had shipped the miners and 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 you know continue the hardware business. Um, and so there was kind of a, a disagreement there, and so we we went and started our own company in April of this year um, called Foundation Devices. So that's currently what I'm working on now is it's called Foundation. Um, and I'm extremely excited to actually show you and, and everyone, um, you know, hopefully some, some launches in my class, uh, you know, the finished product here in actually like a few weeks. Um, it should be, the, the prototype should be done. Um, but actually before we started, I was showing Masha, this is just like a, I don't know if you can actually really see this because it's, it's just a 3D print. Um, it's not the actual device, but this is like the size of, of what it's going to be, um, our first product. And this is called Passport. So it's a, uh, a cryptocurrency key storage device, so a Bitcoin hardware wallet. And so you'll be able to transact Bitcoin with this device uh, using QR codes. So it's completely air-gapped. There's no ports. There's no rechargeable lithium ion battery, um, no Bluetooth, no Wi-Fi, none of that. It just communicates directly off of images. Um, so it's, it's a really secure and, and private device. Uh, for your Bitcoin transactions. So that's what I've been working on more recently. And, and we've actually raised a pre-seed round. And like I mentioned, we're going through the prototypes right now. So we're really excited to, to build and launch that so that we can kind of, no pun intended, build the foundation for the crypto space hardware wise. And kind of, you know, after this, build more products like uh, nodes and 
routers and other things um, that I can't talk about right now. Um, but really cool stuff for for the Bitcoin industry to kind of support you know that next wave of ideology around sovereign money and decentralization and all of these principles you know that that people want in their day to day lives but don't really have you know there's like this big gap that you know people like we were talking about even with entrepreneurship it's it's like if someone tells you about bitcoin you start thinking like man this is way out there like this is insurmountable right so we're trying to make it to where it's super easy um, to get involved and to get started and to actually utilize uh, cryptocurrency and bitcoin easily um, so that it can be you know more mainstream or more well adopted in the space so that's that's kind of the goal of, of the new company and, and where we're headed our our main focus is is uh, making the device uh, verifiable and and trustable without having us uh, basically be able to do anything bad to the device. Like we want our users to know that no matter what, um, that their device and their keys are going to be protected, and that there isn't uh, any gaps in the middle of the supply chain where someone like an attacker could come in and mess with the device or change the firmware or do something malicious to affect um, that user's keys. So our our biggest focus is on is on that, and the way that we do that is through verifiable materials. So, for example, uh, the screen that's going to be included on the device, um, it, the circuitry of the screen is etched directly into the glass, so that we can easily verify that uh, circuitry at production through an X-ray and make sure that there's no embedded processors or other things in that display that could capture information um and to give you an example of something like like that there uh like if someone took your iphone uh and replaced the screen on on your iphone there could be a chip in that screen and, and you couldn't even know it that could be taking all your capacitive you know input data and stuff like that luckily apple has really great security they're one of the best privacy companies in 2020 but um you know still with other devices even devices in our space or or other other you know lcds have that potential to have that processor in there um, same thing for the keypad that's one of the reasons why we decided to do a keypad instead of a, a, a touch lcd a touch screen um, because we can easily verify each of those keypads when we go to make the device um, and it's just certain things like that um, the keys are actually stored on a secure what's called a secure element that's the same secure element that apple uses in the the next the next gen iPhones. So tech, theoretically, we're using like the same key storage methodology. Um, it's just on a device that's not internet connected. So it has much less potential to be, you know, penetrative, tested or, or hacked, basically. So I know you'll also raised a round of funding. Uh, first of all, congrats. And uh, would you have any tips for others about how to go about raising funding? And, and I'd say, you know, if, the same thing with funding goes for just starting a company in general. You know, I'll give some general advice, I guess, is that, um, you know, you can never give up. Uh, you got to keep really hitting the pavement over and over and over again um, and, and just not taking no for an answer. I mean, we when initially we went to raise our fundraising around, it was the start of a pandemic. Right. So a lot of people didn't want to give us any money. They didn't they didn't want to give anyone any money. Right. They were all scared, didn't know what was going to happen, didn't want to allocate funds. Um, or you found the opposite in, in the market where there were certain VC funds that were just blowing money out of the water like it was nothing because everything was so cheap, interest rates were going to zero or still are at zero. So um, there was a large influx into the market as well, but we couldn't find the right people that were you know saying that. Um, that also had the overlap in our industry. So we were finding people that, you know, were into crypto, but didn't want to release money. Or we were finding people that wanted to release money, but didn't know anything about crypto. So it was really hard um, to, to find, you know, that, that sweet spot of either, you know, a small venture capital firm or an individual who, an angel investor who was well aligned with our vision and understood the space and then also had money that they, they wanted to release uh, at the time. So, I mean, like I said, it's it's a lo definitely a lot of rejection, and you just got to really form your narrative. And if if what you're telling investors isn't working, you should probably change what you're telling them, and or change who you're talking to, right? So, I would just say try and try and find the you know the investors or even the people that are most well aligned with your vision. A lot of times, that may not be a big a, a you know a16z capital or a big you know someone like that. Um, it it might 
you know, likely be your uncle or, or, you know, someone, you know, that has 10 grand that they want to seed your company with. Um, so it's really just about finding people that believe in you, that know that you can do what you're, what you're saying you're going to do. Um, and that have the risk tolerance to, to actually give you the money. Um, so I, I, like I said, I would just say to, you know, continually try and, and, you know, hit the pavement as much as you can and just keep going for it and, um, you know, be realistic with your goals. At, at the beginning, we were, we were planning on raising anywhere from one to 5 million for a pre-seed round, but then we actually ended up just taking our number all the way down to a half a million dollars. And then we actually went over it and ended up raising three quarters of a million dollars. So it, it really just depends <laughs> on, um, you know, what you want to do with the money and how you explain you're going to spend it. Um, you know, with hardware, there are a lot of costs uh, that you incur with prototyping and R&D and et cetera. So, um, you know, we, we needed a lot of upfront money to accomplish that. If, if you're trying to do a software product, uh, you probably shouldn't ask for that much money for pre-seed unless it's some crazy idea where you need a, a big team of people. Um, but like, like Lori always says, it's all about getting an MVP out there, right? And showing people that, um, that you can do what you're saying you're going to do. That's the, biggest, that's the biggest thing. If you can show off what you have and uh, convince people that you can make it better, that's the easiest way to get money, uh, to get investment. This has been amazing. And uh, with these like final moments, would you have any tips or advice for any high school students that are interested in entrepreneurship? I would just say, you know, like, like I just said, uh, persistence is key. Um, finding, you know, a lot, something I really remember from launch is uh, building uh, painkillers, not vitamins. So try and try and find a, a problem, and, you know, in, in your everyday life or in society that, that you think is, is just really outdated or wrong or could be improved and, and focus on creating things uh, that solve those issues. Um, obviously, there's a lot to solve in 2020. So um, there's tons of potential companies, nonprofits, uh, you know, businesses that you can make to support your community, support America in general. Um, so really just think about that and, and try and, uh, you know, just go after it and, and try and fail, fail fast. Well, thank you so much, Jacob. It's been amazing catching up and hearing about all your fantastic progress with Foundation Devices. I know I'm really excited to see the progress that you all have in the coming months with your prototype and everything. And I expect amazing things from you as an entrepreneur, as well as with your startup. And uh, thank you, thank you everyone on the call here for joining and uh, look forward to seeing this on YouTube soon.